So um, I just will start a little and hopefully uh, Lars and I will chat some and that you will ask questions as you wish. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a lot to present. I will we'll have a lot to present on Friday and Saturday. But I think the basic premise of all of my teaching now is that what we have thought of as a um, mental disorder or as I think even more reduced as a behavioral disorder is in fact a brain disorder. And there's more and more um, research coming in. And I'm gonna focus uh, primarily on the research from uh, the lab of Ruth Lanius, which is an extensive group of brilliant people um, from uh, London, Ontario. Uh, she is uh, a um, clinical uh, researcher uh, in focusing a great deal on dissociation, but on trauma more generally, and looking at the way that these histories uh, impact the developing brain. <clears throat> and what we are looking at is what I'm about to show you is um, the uh, scans of adult brains. Uh, we're not seeing what this actually looks like in children um, because they're not typically scanned um, or in many cases scannable. But uh, these are effects that persist um, into adulthood and that destroy lives. They also in that process destroy dignity, um, self-esteem, uh, often capacity uh, even to work. So um, uh, the consequences for the individual and for their families and for uh, their intergenerational transmission of trauma, uh, um, most often through neglect and, and all too often through assault um, as well. Uh, they, the implications for society are vast. Uh, and so we really have got to get a handle on this. And once we know that it, uh, it is a disorder of the brain, we have to um, think deeply about how we reach the brain and whether any of the therapies that we presently do are adequate to um, actually uh, reaching the networks and the structures that are so powerfully impacted by early neglect uh, of assault and abuse. So um, this is a, a gray morning here where I am in Massachusetts. I hope it's not, I'm making this grayer for everybody, um, but this is not the unfortunate reality of trauma. So let me show you how this looks in the brain. And we'll, we will, this is only about 15 minutes at most. And this is what we will be talking about uh, in much more detail um, and how this plays out in what we see as psychological symptoms um, on our webinar this coming, the following weekend. Okay, so um, this is uh, now becoming quite famous, but if you haven't seen it, uh, I can describe this to you. Um, I, I will describe it to you if you have seen it. Um, this is a, a um, uh, fMRI of the control group looking at what happens when uh, the brain goes off task. Um, so prior to this scan being taken in the scanner, the person was doing some kind of task uh, and their brain was being scanned under task conditions. It may very well have been a um, mental math, something that would uh, get their attention. And, uh, and when the brain is working, is with its executive network, when this is one of the things we'll talk about um, next weekend, uh, when it has the executive network, uh, the, the on-test network functioning, this network doesn't show up. 
So then the, pe the, the people in the scanner are said, well, you're off task now. Um, we uh, will get back to the task in a few minutes, but in the meantime, you can just relax. So this is the brain at rest. This is hardly at rest, since what you're looking at is the, um, uh, the bold signal. This is the blood oxygen uh, signal uh, of the uh, back of the brain, which is the, this is about the sense of self and time and space and the sense of self in the past. This is a connected network, functionally connected network. And the front of this is the narrative of the self. So this is a person who, when they're not thinking about mental math, is thinking about themselves or themselves and others. They're thinking about themselves in the context of space and time, and they are engaged in the narrative. They are thinking about the fight they had this morning or the date they're gonna have this afternoon or do they want to buy that new computer that they saw advertised, or you know, whatever it could be. But it's always going to be a, a, a reference to the self and to others. Uh, and it's a robust, uh, healthy um, network in people who, and, and these people who are, the only criteria for them to be um, the controls was that they had no history of trauma. So uh, this is a, a beautiful profile. And this is the profile of people who have, as a, these are adults, remember, people who have suffered developmental trauma. Now, let's see if I can make it happen. Is that dramatic? Uh, what's next? Let's see. There it is. Okay. So this is what this network looks like in people with trauma. They don't have a robust sense of self, hardly a sense of self at all. They uh, have no narrative of self and the only little speck that shows up is in the right hemisphere, not the left. This is typically thought of and typically is. The affective center of the brain has a completely different integral narrative to it than the left side of the brain. These are very different functions in, in the human brain. Um, but this is uh, somebody who uh, at the level of the brain has no capacity for a sense of self and other. And some of you who will all get gold stars have read uh, Alan Shore's work, who is brilliant, but not the easiest to read. Um, and his first big book and huge contribution was um, uh, Affect Regulation and the Origin of the Self. And here we have it, right? Where, where does this robust network come from? This comes from the early child, the relationships in early childhood. Where does this, why does this not develop? This does not develop when there is uh, bad, and, and there, bad enough parenting, when there is uh, uh, neglect and um, abuse and assault in childhood. So this is a significant problem that before maybe 10 years at most, I think this, this came out about 10 years ago, that uh, was never seen. And, and not really speculated on in behavioral therapy or in to some degree in uh, psychoanalytic or object relations, but, but not at the level of the brain. So this is um, uh, a study of using essentially that same group that was represented as no self condition. So this is, this is the, so we can think of this now, right, as the network of the self. Right? This is the self-other network. So that, that isn't uh, available 
And what you see uh, at the top is just look, this is the easiest thing for me to explain, is from uh, this way, the red line. So what the red line is showing is that from a section of the PAG is hyper connected to the amygdala. This is actually the, uh, the fear part of the PAG. It's in, the brain is so incredibly um, sectioned off for function, you know, so this part of the PAG quiets reactivity, part of the PAG excites activity. So the part of the PAG, which is periaqueductal gray, or the threat detection uh, part of the brain, is hyper-connected to the amygdala, which we can think of as the fear part of the brain. So this, this is functional. This hyper-connectivity to the uh, amygdala is what causes so many, so much of the reactivity in uh, people with histories of trauma. They are scanning for threat. This part of their brain stem, this is a reptilian structure in the brain. Uh, it's in reptiles, it's in mammals, it's in humans. Uh, and it's scanning for a threat. That's it's so pretty much its sole function, this part of the periaqueductal gray. And it is hyperlinked to the uh, midbrain structure of the amygdala that is the amygdala, which is we now know uh, as the, um, you know, pretty much the fear center of the brain. So um, that's not a good way to live. Scanning for threat, reacting to threat, being in the th uh, thrall of threat all the time. And that is what you see. This is in 100% of the people that we scanned who had dissociative disorders. Okay. So she did um, neurofeedback, uh, and we'll talk about the kind of neurofeedback she did next weekend. But she did neurofeedback uh, and then waited 15 minutes and put people back in the scanner. The reason for 15 minutes is that anything that is there after 15 minutes of intervention is considered to be learned. So this, this is a, now a learned uh, response. It's not going to be a robust one and, until it's practiced. But look at what's changed, is that there is now, there is uh, the connectivity is between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. This is, uh, when you make your way through Alan Shore, this is what happens, this is what he postulates and brings an awful lot of evidence to bear, is what happens when there's good enough parenting. So here we can say bad enough parenting, <laughs> get simple about it, and here is good enough parenting. But it's good enough parenting with the same brain. It's, 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 it's giving people prefrontal uh, in, inhibition of the uh, fear center of their brain. This is with one session of neurofeedback. Now, there's no claim being made here that one session of neurofeedback would hold, but it, it, the potential here is shown in the 80% of the people who had this a particular approach to neurofeedback. And I think all neurofeedback, to my mind, all of neurofeedback and the importance of neurofeedback is to regulate affect. And to regulate affect, we allow for the origin of the self. And this can even be in people who are uh, my age. Um, it is not, does not seem to be an age-dependent um, uh, capacity. It's, it's, it's the inherency of the brain to have a self, to be relational. That's the way that we are built. So we could say that here is the um, beginning of the... Um, 
the capacity for self and other because of the inhibition of fear. Okay, so looking at the same data uh, many months later, we have another astounding finding uh, for the field of, particularly for the field of psychotherapy, but also to help uh, ease the stigma of this terrible uh, impact. So the top is um, in the resting condition. So we see essentially what we saw before, where we see the, the uh, robust nature of the, um, this is the area is called the precuneus or the posterior cingulate. And this, but this is the part of the brain that, that uh, this encodes the past, this is the sense of self and time and space, and this is the narrative. Okay, so this is in controls, i.e. people who have report no early childhood trauma. When you, when you live in the world that many of us live in, it's hard to believe that there actually are people with no childhood trauma, but there, there are um, about 50% of us, maybe a little bit more, who have not had this experience. Um, and for those who have, it's going to look more like this. That there's hardly any narrative. There's no narrative of the self showing up here. And the um, precuneus, uh, the posterior cingulate area, is, um, is uh, uh, hardly showing up either. Yeah. We can talk if you want to, and people have ideas about what kind of psychological state this would leave people in. That's a lot of what Ruth is interested in, actually, is how this all translates into state, state flexibility, lack of flexibility. Um, and, uh, you know, what is the ex lived experience of people who, for the most part, can't put this experience into words or adequate words because it's subcortical, it favors the right hemisphere. Uh, yeah, and it's, uh, it's beyond subcortical, it's way down in the brainstem. Okay, so this is an on re and rest. Then what they did was to uh, give a threat stimulus to the individual. And then those people who um, had no trauma history, they default mode network goes down completely. This is the network at rest, remember? So this is now a network that is organized to meet the threat because this is a, the PAG, the periaqueductal gray. You don't have to remember all this. You just need to know this happens. The, the periaqueductal gray is the um, uh, threat detection. So this brain is completely devoted to figuring out how to respond to the threat, but not so the brains of people with uh, severe uh, early childhood trauma and neglect. What happens for them is that the, uh, the PAG activates, but so does a good amount of the default mode network. So this isn't a brain at rest. This is, this is supposed to be a brain at rest. This is a brain that the self other system has been activated by the threat detection. So without threat, there's no sense of self. With threat, the, the structures for, or the, the networks for the uh, sense of self and other come online. If this is the only way that you could feel a sense of self, that that would organize, that you would feel some continuity or some felt sense that you existed, that you that had continuity, that had some kind of substance. It, it would be very tempting, if not inevitable, that you would engage in uh, risky behaviors, threatening behaviors, in it, put yourself at risk of threat uh, so that you could 
uh, uh, feel and have a sense that you existed at all. So I want, I'll stop there. This is an absolutely intriguing uh, topic. And then, um, so that will be mostly the first day uh, and we'll go into it in much more detail. And the second day, we'll go into what to do about this uh, to see if we can, um, we can help people who are suffering these, uh, uh, these brains. Okay, let me stop the sharing, get all of your pictures online. Okay, so. Thank you, Siren. Yep. Um, I wonder if we could uh, um, go back historically a little bit and maybe, do you mind talking a little bit about what, uh, how you first got involved in uh, this combination of brain training, neurofeedback and psychotherapy? Um, yeah, uh, I, um, I was a, uh, a psychodynamic psychotherapist, and in fact, I still am. I still consider myself to, to be that, uh, to think that way. But I have, uh, in, um, uh, in the mid-90s, a friend of mine asked me if I would be a subject for this thing called neurofeedback that made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. We, she talked about it, explained it to me over dinner. But at this point, the only way that we even thought about the brain was all mind. And it was a, the brain and the mind were not connected yet in our, in, in, at least in trauma thinking, uh, was as a receptor for a uh, good part, mostly uh, toxic uh, drugs. So I, I didn't have much idea of brain function and nor did the public at large at this point, the scientific population, because no one was really talking about circuitry. And she starts telling me that these people have, uh, you know, you can play a, a, a discover that you can play a, a, a game with your uh, uh, video game with your brain and it can, um, uh, and you can uh, change the way your brain works. So I was completely skeptical about this, but she was my friend, so I agreed to do this, and I did it. And uh, I have one of these histories, and what happened was absolutely remarkable. This was a, a, um, uh, over a uh weekend about seven hours of neurofeedback as i've said to many of you have heard this before i'm not recommending you do this um i just am saying that this is how i got into the field and it was it was a a huge shift in my reality as a result of this training uh which i remember i was completely skeptical about and my friend wasn't completely sold either so it wasn't it wasn't at least by the nature of the experience, uh, a, a placebo. Uh, it was, there was no, no one there to induce a placebo effect. Um, and one of the things that I realized um, was that I wasn't feeling this level of ambient fear that I lived with all my life. Uh, um, that was by the next day. And when I was also aware of it so my sorrow response was gone and that I, I had that all the time um, I was at that point the clinical director of a treatment facility for severely disturbed kids I needed to learn more about this I had adult patients as well private patients as well and uh, when I realized that this was quieting fear and that that could be done this quickly and this significantly, uh, I had to learn it. And, but I never believed, and I don't believe now, that this can be done uh, outside of the frame of psychotherapy. I think you need to have, you know, we're, we're trying, we're talking about developing a sense of self and other. We have to provide the template for that in the, in the room. So I have always used it 
uh, together with psychotherapy. I could say, and it'd be politically acceptable if I said I would use it as an adjunct to psychotherapy. But in fact, I don't know whether the psychotherapy is the adjunct to neurofeedback or neurofeedback is the adjunct to psychotherapy because neurofeedback itself is so profound and it's reaching these structures. Thank you. And you've, you've talked to, um, well, good. I, I have a couple of questions and then, then I was thinking that we could open it up and see if other folks have some things that they would like to ask. Um, one question is that the, 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 to me, the most startling uh, result is encapsulated in one of those slides that you showed about how there's almost this reversal between the sense of self that people who don't experience a history of trauma, um, of how their default mode network gets activated under you know normal circumstances, and then how that's almost turned inside out for people who have a history of trauma, who actually settle into a sense of sense of self when they are under threat. Can you talk a little bit more about what that what that means and what the implications of that are for for therapy? Yeah, well, I, I think what it means is that a lot of the the behaviors that are the most distressing that we deal with, with adolescent and adult patients particularly, that are self-harming or putting themselves at risk, um, that are have been called acting out. So they have been seen as symbolic representations of some other problem in life, right? So shoplifting is a good example. Shoplifting is endemic in this population. Uh, so shoplifting uh, puts the person at, at threat and uh, gives them a sense of agency. Uh, and so the sense that they exist that, and that they are agents in their own being, where everyone else's threat detection system would take over and they wouldn't do it, at least on this level, and without a moral implication, just the issue of threat, they would recognize that this was pure threat and there was no, there would be, and their sense of self is turned off completely. For those who have uh, a trauma, their sense of self comes on board. So what do we make of that? Well, one of the things we make of it is that acting out uh, or these dysfunctional behaviors have a profound neurological function. Uh, at least as far as this research uh, suggests. So uh, it changes our, for me anyway, it changes the way I interpret these behaviors. I would now, will now meet them with, um, with psychoeducation. This, this is, slide is six or seven weeks old. I mean, six or seven months old. So it's not like we've had this data around for a long time. This is just changes the whole way of thinking about psychotherapy for me anyway. And so, um, you know, it would, it would, I wouldn't interpret it the way that I would, I wouldn't interpret it in my own mind that way. I would show them what's happening in their brains uh, and why they might be engaging in that behavior. And I can share with all of you that for the vast majority of people and most of the people to some degree or another that I've worked with have been self-harmers, the self-harm goes away. And I had three patients, this was just astounding to me. I had three patients in one week who had been doing neurofeedback for uh, you know, a month or two, or, or maybe more, but not much more, and whose self-harm behavior had just dried up. And they said, uh, to, they each one used exactly the same phrase, I never want to be hurt again. And the only one who had been hurting them physically had been themselves, okay? So something just dramatic and profound had gone on. Um, and it also, for working with this population is a very, um, is very taxing for therapists because they are, uh, we are always dealing with some threat of death or self-harm when, when these are the systems that are engaged. Uh, and um, a threat to themselves or threat to other people 
uh, and it can't, you know, or uh, injury, um, death, suicide. So this has got, if this was all that neurofeedback did, and it didn't eventually bring about a sense of self as well, they would be incredible as an intervention, just to stop, ease the uh, imperative towards self-harm. But now we understand the whole issue of self-harm and threat in a very different way than we have before. So it, it really changes the playbook in my mind. Great, thank you. Um, there, as I understand it, there is a lot that's not understood about how neurofeedback actually works on the brain and what, what the actual uh, work is there. But as someone who's been doing this work for several decades, for two decades plus, um, I wonder if you could uh, help uh, sort of help us to understand what what your sense of it is, this, this sort of... Uh, Hand in hand work of the therapy and the and the neurofeedback and, and how that how that works to in, particularly with the affect reg regulation and calling the fear from the PAG and so on. Well, that's it, Lars. You've just answered the question. Really, <laughs> I, I think the whole deal is affect regulation. I think that's the gift of good enough parenting. I think that's what takes us forward in life. That makes life possible is that we are not living in terror. We are able to regulate our, our affect, our emotional responses, um, that they don't overtake us. They don't become a raison d'etre. They don't become the way we understand who we are. You know, when I, I've had people say, I, what, if you take away fear, who will I be? I am fear. You know, it's like, uh, okay, well, that's a profound existential question, but it, actually just becomes a little bit of a fade out of these states and people adjust to it quite well. There can be periods where you know, I'm really startled. And I was a little bit after that seven, uh, that, that seven hours saying, I didn't know who I was, right? I had lived in one brain and then I had arrived in another. And you live in one brain and you arrive in another, it, you are a different person and you have to do just to get this to, back onto um, headphones to who you are you have to uh, uh, and that's one another one of the very important aspects of, of psychotherapy is the therapist recognizes this and the therapist uh, helps you uh, gain a uh, and trust and accepts and befriends this new sense of self that's great. Thank you. Um, and uh, so one, one last question, then maybe we could open it up and see if there are some other questions. Um, one, of the, one of the things about where we are time-wise, you, you were saying how the, the research that Ruth has done just within the last year is really changing, you know, as implications for therapy and for using technology and brain training and so on. Um, a you know, someone who approaches healing and doing the work of therapy could be forgiven for feeling like suddenly this world has opened up to where I need to be an expert in neuroscience. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, uh, you know, does, does someone need to go, go back to school and learn all the, all the ins and outs of how the brain works and so on? Or, or how, how, how would you suggest somebody gets comfortable with these, with this, uh, this whole new, uh, domain? That's a very wonderful question. I, you know, I, I didn't know any of this. None of this was available to know. There was no, there were, I was doing our feedback with people all the time because I was working with arousal, right? And, and uh, seeing if they could quiet their level of arousal, get quieter, get, you know, and that was a frequency dependent thing. It's built into the eager system and some other systems as well. It's a frequency dependent property. So for, for almost everybody, it is, you can get calmer uh, if you find the right frequency. You can get more alert if you find the right frequency in the right placement, the right protocol. I have a webinar uh, that's up on your site, I think, that goes through this in detail. Um, it's almost a second book on this. 
But so I didn't know any of this. And as I said, it wasn't there to be known. Um, it, it turned out, I mean, I had a conversation, a lunch conversation with Bessel, a friend of mine, Bessel Vanderkoek, that, who's Bessel, that's the only Bessel around, um, uh, at, uh, at an attached conference. And he became intrigued with this. Uh, as a result of that, I trained at the trauma center. Um, and one of my trainees at the trauma center was Ruth Lanius. She got it immediately that this was going to be the thing, that this was the right way to think about mental illness. Okay. So, and then she began her research. So we met in 2000 and, um, six, I think it was, 2000, yeah, 2006. Um, and we did the training in 2006. And this uh, has all been since 2006. So you won't have to learn it. You, you will want to learn enough about how to use an our feedback system. And you want to have your, uh, a paradigm, a uh, one one view, one humble view about how the brain, how we can help these brains um, that serves you well. And, and that for me is the arousal model, which we'll also talk about a little bit on the, on the, uh, the arousal regulation model on the, 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 in next weekend. Um, but, uh, um, you know, you can be just pragmatic about this and find protocols that help. But, you know, now you have the neuroscience that backs you up. And particularly those of you who want to share this with others who want to um, uh, bring the word, <laughs> you, you want to learn it. But it's fascinating to learn. And Ruth's work, I think, is particularly available. She's made it particularly available. So I, I am a self-taught neuroscientist, um, and I've learned it all in the last 10 years. I'm 79. So it's like, it's not too late, guys. It's not too late to learn. That's great. Thank you. Um, if folks have questions, you can either let me know in the chat or, or speak up. It looks like uh, there's a lot of folks who are comfortable uh, just listening today. There was one question on the, uh, on the YouTube channel um, about the Val Brown system. If you have any thoughts about, about that uh, approach to neurofeedback. A Val Brown system works well with a, a lot of people. Um, and I think it's, though it's very hard if it doesn't work for somebody, um, you can't make it work. You can't change. It doesn't have a lot of, of possibility for change. Um, for ch changing the approach that you use. And sometimes, uh, often actually, well, no, I don't know. I don't know enough. I've trained myself with a Val system several times. I have friends who use it or are quite devoted to it. Uh, I, had, I had a negative response in using it. Um, and I know that Bessel and Misha also did. It, it, it's, there's no really, truly, there's no one size fits all. And w once I, so it's not normalizing a brain. We're not about normalizing a brain. We are really about, in my mind, and this is a quantum universe, folks, and nobody's got the answer to this, but the, the, the brain is a quantum universe. So we've got one small angle into this universe and how to affect it positively. And my small angle into it, and the one that's coded in the system that I use, which is eager, is uh, the arousal model and quieting uh, fear uh, so that uh, people can get on with their lives. I, when, when Norton uh, asked me to write this book or when we came to the point of the titling the book, I wanted to call it Calming the Fear-Driven Brain and then developmental, you know, tr treating developmental trauma with neurofeedback is the second part of the title because it's so much the more salient piece. But this is an academic publisher, so it had to become the treatment of developmental trauma. So, but, so the, really the important piece here is that we quiet uh, and regulate arousal, anger, shame, and fear being the big three.
that uh, people end up dealing with uh, with trauma. Um, so one, oh, by the way, the, the Val Brown system I've mentioned was, is NeuroOptimal. That's the name of the system. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot for folks, um, because both of the sort of uh, way that neuroscience research is exploding these days, as well as the technological developments that happen simultaneously, there's, a, there's, there's quite a move toward doing more data analysis and QEG kind of approach. Um, and it seems like your, your approach to this stuff is, is different in the sense that it really puts the, the relationship, the self and other into the middle of that. I wonder if you could if you could talk a little bit about what that what what your thoughts are about QEG based uh, neurofeedback and and the self and the other. Well, you know, uh, uh, I am a psychotherapist. What I'm interested in, and I've worked with attachment disruption and developmental trauma for my entire now lengthy career, um, and uh, the. The, so the model that was always going to fit the best with my thinking was going to be an arous the arousal model. And that, that's, uh, that's a model that is very personalized. It's very much about how an individual responds to a protocol, the placement, the frequency, and the time. And if they don't respond well to that, I change the protocol. This is the problem with one size fits all. It's also the problem with QEGs because there's always an understanding built into every QE, every uh, Q-based model of what a normal brain looks like. Well, we're, as I said to a group recently, there's not, there's not anybody, and I can absolutely, I don't know, as many of you I don't know, but I can guarantee you will agree with the statement that none of you want a normal brain because a normal brain by metrics is 100 IQ, right? And if anybody here wants me to train them to 100 IQ, then uh, at least in, the, in, the, in this example, in this metric, um, we could probably do that. But that would be the, the theory of a normal brain, right? We don't want, that's not what we're working for. So what are we working for? Well, with this group anyway, we are working for optimal affect regulation, which will allow them optimal function, but before it even allows them optimal function, it allows them a sense of self and other. And it all comes online pretty much around the same time. Unfortunately, as in early development, this is not quick. and not only are we not, don't have the first 18 months to repeat, we have to undo the systems in the brain that have been built on fear and fear response. So, um, yeah, so it, it can take, it takes time, but uh, you see the changes, incremental changes, I think almost from the beginning. So, and, and as I said earlier, if you just took self-harm out of the picture, right? It's a huge therapeutic um, breakthrough. But, but you know, you, it does lead you to wonder when you look at this brain, what's going on in psychotherapy if there's no self and there's no other? You don't exist and a patient doesn't exist to herself. What, what's the conversation we're having here? And who's having it? Yeah, it really is a profound thing. Mm -hmm. And we continue, you know, to get the same very limited, disheartening effects from the approaches we're using because we don't understand uh, this fundamental uh, neuroscience. That's right. Um uh, there was a question uh, about the length of training that 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 is appropriate. Do you do you have a sense of as um, for folks who are doing? I mean, the the way that I've heard it posed before is that it's a bit like do you want to 
you know, do, uh, do exercise. Well, when am I done doing my exercises? Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what, uh, what that looks like in the clinical environment. Like how, how does, how does a therapist make a decision about what, what kind of training is going to be going on or, how, or, or maybe even closer to it? How would a therapist approach that conversation with their client? Um, well, uh, it's, um, it's, it's entirely individual. And I'm asked this question all the time, and I really can't answer it. Uh, you can't answer it, I guess, on two premises. One is you can't answer, you don't know how this brain is going to respond to training. You just don't know. It's a, it's, it's, um, uh, you, it, it can't be predicted. It's much too complex uh, to be predictable um, at all. You can't, I've had a number of people who have gone the QEG route who have normalized the, their brain maps, but don't feel any better. What do I make of that? I don't know what to make of that. Or recently I, uh, I had an accident and in the accident I hit the back of my head. So I, I hard on the on a wall, I fell backwards. And, the, um, and I went in to see my cue. To, because I have hundreds of them. I have friends who do cues for me. So I probably have a brain that has more QEGs than any other than Jay Gunkelman, who does them routinely too. So Jay and I probably are, are neck and neck on who's got the most uh, QEGs of their brain. So anyway, I went in to have my cue looked at and we looked at pre and post from 2019 compared to post my fall and, and 21. That was the most recent data we had. The QEGs that I was taking were pre and post uh, silent retreats because I wanted to see if we could discern what would happen with retreats. And this is where you can go with your own feedback. You don't stay stuck in trauma land. You can go into some other very fascinating realms. And you know, if you can afford to do it and, and it catches you, you will go on, you'll do it forever, right? But if you have a, a limited clinical goal or, 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 you know, it's to stop self-harm or it's to, you know, be able to um, have an intimate relationship with your partner or, or whatever the goal is and that's met, then that can be the end. But just to go back to the EEG thing. So I went in and I had my uh, EEG and it was after the fall. So before I had the, uh, before I went into the retreat, uh, my brain looked a certain way. It didn't look a whole lot different when I came out of the retreat, although the retreat was mind blowing for me. So there was already a huge question. Now we're looking at the post retreat compared to post uh, possible concussion. And the hypercoherence, which is a problem, and you, you don't want to be hypercoherent or hypocoherent. You don't want to have too much conversation going on between sites or too little. And the hypercoherence that I had in my brain was gone or much diminished after the blow to my head. What, what do I make of this? I have no idea. My, my brain map looks better after. I knocked, you know, I, it wasn't unconscious, but I hit my head hard against the wall. So what do I make of that? I have no idea, except that I, I don't think the cues should be, this is back to the other question, I don't think cues should be the way we approach this. Um, at least uh, 19 channel cues, which is what I was looking at in every case. Um, I don't know so much about other uh, emerging approaches, but I don't think that the standard Q um, is, is um, uh, it gives us enough information. Um, and, and in terms of length of time, that's really a conversation that goes on between the therapist and the, uh, and the patient or client. Um, and it has all, all kinds of, you know, ex external uh, constraints on it that don't have to do with the benefit of training. I think you can benefit from training. I think there's even reason to 
to think, if not, we have no proof of this, but there's even reason to think that it has something to do with um, aging and uh, easing the de depredations of aging and um, keeping mentally fit and, you know, physically fit too. You know, so, you know, it's just stress. If any, if any of you caught the other fabulous webinar that uh, Lars has put on this year, um, it was with Donna Jack and, Jack, Jackson Nakasawa, who's talking about the impact of um, stress on the immune system. And the, uh, there's an awful lot of information about mental illness and what we think of as mental illness and uh, immune uh, system, hi hyperimmune responses and autoimmune diseases um, and how connected this is. But even if you don't have something as terrible as an autoimmune disease, we are all dealing with stress and neurofeedback at its most fundamental is a, uh, it helps you to become stress resilient. So if you're a, a um, Steph Curry and you're playing top flight basketball who does neurofeedback, he's doing it for peak performance, but what is he actually doing? He's doing it to reduce stress and reactivity. And so, uh, so am I doing that with my brain? And so am I doing that as well with my patients, for my patients' brains? So it's, there's, there's, no, there's no ending that we need to have uh, that is called for by the training. You ju it just keeps getting uh, better uh, the more the, the brain gets feedback on its own function. But, the, uh, but there are other reasons to stop that are clinical or financial or, you know. So existentially, I think everybody should train. I think everyone should have systems that are easy to understand, that are highly flexible and that are in their homes. But they also need to be doing it with someone who's, they need their, they need their uh, other, they need their devoted other. Yeah, great. I like the dream. Um, so, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, too. yeah, and uh, thanks for bringing up the 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 webinar course with uh, Donna Jackson Nakazawa um, because I wanted to ask you uh, about your thoughts about the pandemic and and the sort of additional layer of stress that that uh, imposes upon people who already are, uh, you know coming to life with a, with a history of trauma. And even for those who do not have that history um, and, and what role you see for, for neurofeedback or for, uh, for therapy and so on to, to address these. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in, we are social animals, right? We are meant to be with one another we are meant to be at these events that are now uh, forbidden. We are meant to be hugging one another. We are meant to be comforting one another. We are meant to be sharing our, our lives um, outside of our houses. Um, that's the, our nature. These are, so that is stressing every single human being on the planet. Um, it's a necessary stress. These lockdowns are necessary. This, um, we have to get by this um, virus, but the virus is stressing the very systems that make us the most human. And if you already have a brain like the brain that I showed you to begin with, uh, you already have a brain that has a very um, impaired self-other system, and you find yourself then without school or without the why or without your uh, basketball pickup game or whatever it is. There you get social contact and you get time with other, um, or you are suffering the death of your family members all of that just would compound this situation and, and make it even harder for people to make connection and to soothe themselves, to make, to, 
to comfort themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, this becomes a self-soothing capacity. Affect regulation really means that you can soothe yourself, right? You don't, you don't go off on one end and, you know, and scream at your boss, but you also can just soothe yourself. Right? So you're not, you're not, you're regulated in all ways. And that is the property of, of self and other. We depend on being with other people, our loved ones, to, uh, uh, for this kind of um, uh, comfort. This is our nature. And so the, the, this COVID, uh, uh, this pandemic has been a, um, an unprecedented and terrible lab for what happens when our social natures are so stressed. And I think that, you know, for some people, I was, I was just talking in a whole set of circumstances that I ended up meeting a woman uh, online who um, lived a half a block away from the supermarket where the mass shooting was. It's hard to keep track in the United States where they are, but this one was in Boulder. And I was uh, talking with her about, um, you know, her 14-year-old kid. 14 years old, who lives uh, half a block away from a site of mass murder, and that she wasn't recovering. She was really, you know, and I was letting her know about neurofeedback. I was letting her know about breathing um, so that, uh, you know, that she, her 14 year old, who now had been at the most social period of her life, had been shut down and had been shut down and now had a terrible trauma on top of it. So neurofeedback has a very important role to play. I don't know if we can play it because yet, because I don't know that it is recognized enough. And that's the point of these webinars, to do these webinars so that people really understand what the hope is here, uh, not only for COVID, but for all conditions that that of, of early trauma and even later trauma that stress our systems. That's great. Thank you so much, Seaburn. Thanks for taking the time today. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and once again, the, the course that Seaburn is going to be doing is a two-day uh, two intensive. It's two half days from 9 to 1230, uh, the next Friday, the 9th of April. Um, and, uh, and then Saturday, the 10th of April, um, 9 to 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. So um, if you go to the, the eGLearn website, there will be a link there for, and you can find out what the time is for your particular time zone. Um, we encourage you to come and join us. Uh, and um, if you have any questions, please get in touch. I thank everyone for, for coming today and being part of this. Thank you, Seaburn. Thank you, Elsie. I look forward to uh, seeing you uh, and um, into your questions. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye, thank you. Bye, you're welcome. Bye-bye.